Uh, take your Bibles and open up to Genesis 41. We're not going to do one of those lessons today. I will leave those up to uh, Carla to, to finish up because uh, I just didn't have time to read through all of the uh, teaching stuff this week. So I was already working on something in Daniel, but I, I realized it was related to, in, in a way, to Joseph here in Genesis, where we left off, I think, last week, where Joseph ascends to the second in command over Egypt. And since Egypt is the dominant imperial power of um, the ancient Near East at this time, he's essentially the second in command over the entire planet, uh, as far as what a planet could be defined as, all the land and stuff. So what we're going to talk about today is, is how Joseph, and to a lesser extent, Daniel, actually serve as uh, types of messiahs, how they serve as types of Christ uh, through the, their ascensions to, to the roles that they play. So the ascension and the role of Joseph can be viewed messianically, or Christologically if you prefer, uh, for the role that Jesus will play when he becomes the ascended king in whom all authority in heaven and earth has been placed. And if you can read Joseph's story and to a lesser extent Daniel's, who we'll spend a little bit more time with than Joseph, we'll jump off to this and we'll see how uh, we should be reading the four Gospels and the story of Jesus as if it, it climaxes not in the cross so much as in the resurrected ascension on the other side. So uh, let's read Genesis 41, which is uh, a part, part of the text that we covered last week. Somebody read verses 37 down through 44. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, Can we find anyone like this man, one in whom the, is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all the people who are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took the signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command, and people shouted before him, Make way! Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Keep going, or? Yeah, one more verse, okay. please. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift hand or foot in all of Egypt. Okay, so... That's essentially what we covered last week, but it's just Pharaoh exalting Joseph at the age of 30, if you kept right reading, to the second highest position in the empire for the purpose of keeping everybody alive through a famine. So for the next 14 years, Joseph, who foretold the seven years of plenty and seven years of famine, is in charge of everything. And he's going to die in charge of everything. Uh, so it's not just going to be for 14 years, but it's for, for this purpose. It is for a purpose. Keep everybody alive. Keep the empire going beyond the next stage of trouble. There's not much that I want to talk about in regards to Joseph, because that's a fairly straightforward idea. Does anybody have any questions about what that would look like or entail? Being second in command. He's vice regent. Does anybody watch Game of Thrones? Okay. Yeah. So he's the hand of the king. Right. Right? It's the same thing. Unlike our vice president, who has practically no power, he has all the power, as Pharaoh says, except him only in respect with a throne, will I be greater than you. So, any any questions on that? Did you all find 41? Yeah. Okay. It took us a second. We were struggling there. For no, a that's okay. okay, now turn to Daniel 6. <laughs> we're we're going to do a little bit of reading here and a little bit of explanation in Daniel, because Daniel is uh, the only other person in all of Scripture where, like Joseph, there's no recorded sin in his life. But he's going to be accused of something in Daniel 6. And, and I essentially just want to read this chapter, but this is Daniel in the lion's den. And maybe you've heard that story before, but, but I doubt anybody has ever connected it to what comes specifically after in Daniel 7. It's... it's ordered this way for a purpose because the events of Daniel 6 and Daniel 7 are years apart, but Daniel 6 comes long after Daniel 7. But they're, they put Daniel 6, not chronologically, 
but in, uh, in the order of preeminence so that you will read Daniel 7 in light of Daniel 6. So it's, it's topically arranged, and we're going to talk about why. So I'm, I'm going to do some of the reading here because I want to get through the whole chapter, and then I'll have some other people read in chapter 7. We'll see how much of this we can get through. So starting in verse 1, it says, It pleased Darius, who's uh, emperor of the Medo-Persian Empire that's overthrown Babylon by this point. So Darius appointed 120 uh, satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, with three administers over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to hand him over the whole kingdom. Sound familiar? At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, may King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree into writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Remember, he's in Babylon, a thousand miles away. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human except you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decrees you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group. Man, they keep doing this as a group. They went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the laws of the Medes and the Persians, No decree or edict or king issued can be changed. So the king gave the orders and brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating or without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At first dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near to the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesties, uh, majesty, singular. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. Then Daniel was lifted from the den. No wound was found on him because he had trusted his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. Before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and the peoples of every language on the earth, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, People must fear and revere the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered greatly during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Okay, again, chronologically, this is going to take place after, long after Daniel 7. Uh, but the point of this story is that Daniel is 
falsely charged. That's one thing. And the story goes uh, out of its way to make sure we know Daniel is innocent of all charges. But is he? He was praying, he which was is praying the uh-huh. against the law. To God. Right. Which, yes, morally correct. He was not falsely accused of anything. He was rightly accused mm-hmm. of breaking the law of the land, which could not be repealed as the law of the Medes and the Persians. So, so I, the, the way the story is told, the entire group, 120 ish, you know, men, going and conspiring with all their power without Daniel, who's a part of this group, is supposed to be seen as they're them manipulating the king and creating an unjust law. Sure. Sure. It, 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 it is entrapment, it is exactly. And it is the law. So it's the, not falsely. But, but the point of, of what Darius is, is saying by the end of the story is this should never have been a law. And in fact, God has justified that Daniel is innocent by saving his life. Okay. So you, you, you don't just take the law, you take the story. Well, did, did the gods or God here, who is a higher authority than Darius in these 120, declare Daniel guilty or innocent. Well, he survived the death, came up out of the dead. So who was really in the wrong? The people thrown into the uh, lion's den and actually trampled. Sure. So, and I'm probably being pedantic, but that's still not what it says. With the law? The law said this, and whether it was correct or not, that is of the... He still broke the law he against still broke the, king, the, law, so that, the, the king. He was not falsely accused of breaking the law. He broke the law. <clears throat> but the law was incorrect. And, and, and yeah. so the, the, the point but, is, heaven didn't recognize the law. Right. So he, he didn't break a law. Within the rules of the story that it's happening in. But because also, Darius he didn't sin not, against the king. It, because the king didn't intend for him to not be able to work. If, 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 right. if it was just the human realm, right. yes. yes. Okay. But, but when you take, because here's the point. Heaven and earth are not separate spaces. Heaven and earth overlap. Mm-hmm. And the place that, that heaven and earth overlap is the sacred space, the holy ground, the temple areas, yeah. uh, and the tabernacle and stuff. And so the, the, the point of, of the story is heaven, or I say a, a background idea of the story, is that heaven over, can over, overrule earth. Earth can make all the laws that they want, and heaven can ignore all the laws that they want, or the God who sits enthroned in heaven, we, we might say. Mm-hmm. And the, the way the story completes is, the, is that Daniel was innocent because the God who sits enthroned in heaven ignored the human laws. So Daniel didn't break uh, any laws in the, in the court of God. In the same way that Jesus healed people on the Sabbath. It broke human law, but it was the right. So not, yeah, or, I'm not arguing yeah. that at all. Or so, just in the you, language that it's described in in this situation, coming from Darius, who uh-huh. was not a Jew. Correct. So this is not his law that he is. Uh, he's saying, "Oh, well, you you, you honor the Jewish law, which I'm suddenly good with, even though I created this <laughs> other law." <laughs> like it's a it's an, a matter of background and context. Yes, in, it, within the context, Darius is saying, "Oh." Well, I shouldn't have done that, but I did. Mm-hmm. And he's still saying you were falsely accused. It's linguistically it's, it bothers. It, 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 it's like, um, okay, so, okay, Daniel's, yeah, da- Daniel's guilty. Yeah. Daniel's guilty in one court, so he appeals above that court, sure. and he's found right. innocent in that court, so right. he's not found guilty in the other court. So the question That's is, the point. After that, did Darius change his mind and eradicate that? The law can't be it, repealed, uh, but it was only 90 days, right? So, 30, 30. It was only 30 days, so it ran out soon. Yeah, and, and, and there's no indication that his uh, issued decree in verse 26 and 27 for the worship of the God of Daniel ever ran out, which is an interesting part of the story. Right. And, and the whole point of, of these people trying to get a 30-day repeal is obviously to entrap Daniel. Right. So you're supposed to view Daniel as innocent because he appealed to a higher court. That court found him innocent, and so he is not guilty of any crime. So you have to you have to read it with so both get, courts I, in I mind. I get it within the context of it, but within the like, way when this is happening, it. human beings, then they would not have seen it in that manner. Yes, from from the human's perspective, and of course Darius tried. Right. Uh, but even even Darius before this is is you know trying to appeal to the gods. Mm-hmm. May the may your servant the uh, Daniel servant of the living God has wait has your God saved you? May your God whom you continually serve, rescue you. I mean, he's Darius is vastly aware of the limits of his own power. I get it. So, 
Okay, so, okay. Um, I hear what you're saying. It, and and it, I, it, it's a matter of double yeah. jeopardy. Darius yeah. can't come along and, and declare, well, the gods declared him innocent, but he still broke my law, so I guess I'll throw him back in. What good would that do? He's rescued him once. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so when you recognize higher powers than just yourself and sitting on the throne, uh, and the fact that a higher power deemed you innocent and stuff, human power has run out. The power of the gods or the living God here is still in play. Which is a part of uh, of what goes on in chapter 7. Okay, let's read chapter 7, and then we'll, we'll reflect on both these chapters together. Let's read the first 13 verses. Somebody read uh, verses 1 through 8, or if you want to split it up, uh, 1 through 4 and then 5 through 8. I don't care which. In the first year of Bel Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind, and he was lying on his bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground, so that it stood on two feet like a man, and the heart of a man was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, Get up, and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Okay, so money, we're going to read 9 through 13. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, the hair of his head was like what was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words of the horn was speaking. The boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancients. The Ancient of Days, and was led into his presence. Whether you wanted or 14 mm -hmm. also. 14 also. Okay. I, I did say 13. Okay. I meant, I, yeah, you're he but you're was right. given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Okay. Notice that that language there, his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom will never be destroyed. It's exactly the same language as verse 26 of chapter 6. He is a living God. He endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. But the Son of Man figure is, is distinct from the Ancient of Days figure in the scene. So, let, so let, let's talk about this a little bit here because in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, that would be probably around 553 B.C., maybe 550. It depends on whether Daniel's using an, an account of his co-regency with his father or uh, the start of his own individual reign. Uh, but I would estimate somewhere between 53 and 55, 553, 550 BC uh, that this is happening. And, and this is still a king of Babylon, which means, again, Darius, the Medes and the Persians who conquered Babylon, that's, that's decades later. So this is happening well before chapter 6, but it's put in this order so that you will read 7, 1 through 14 in light of the events of 
chapter 6. So Daniel going into the lion's den is, is going into death. It is a mythological story as much as it is a historical story about going down into the realm of the dead because that's one way that you can conceive of a lion's den. And yet he's resurrected or brought up out of the lion's den, even though he never died. Just, just think mythologically here for a second about what's going on. And then you think about this character happening in verses 13 and 14. Let's break this down a little bit. The four beasts, where we're going to find out in 15 and on when he asks for an interpretation from one of the celestial beings standing there, the four beasts represent four kings or four kingdoms, depending on your translation. Four kingdoms come and then God and his celestial court meet. And then... And in their meeting, they strip all the power away from the empires and kingdoms and kings of this world, and they give it to the Son of Man. But note how we read this wrong and we apply this wrong. So obviously, who's the Son of Man? Right. Je Jesus' main title for himself is the Son of Man. He's using it exactly out of Daniel 7. He is telling his story and conceiving his story of the rescue and redemption of Israel and humanity as the Son of Man who's coming to take all authority in heaven and earth, to, to establish a dominion and a kingdom that is without end. We don't really read his story that way because we get hung up on the cross uh, and, and the forgiveness of our own sins, and we're very selfish readers. That's a conversation for another time, but I'm trying to point this out to you. Where does the Son of Man come into? In, the, in, in Daniel 7, these verses that we just read, where is he entering into? Where is the scene set? It's a celestial courtroom, which is different from Micah's courtroom that we talked about on Sunday mornings the last really two weeks. Had a so yeah, a little bit. <laughs> you, if, if, if you pick up on the courtroom scenes, courtrooms are everywhere in the Bible. Uh, so this is a celestial courtroom. So where are they? Jerusalem. Um, it, Jerusalem doesn't get mentioned here. It's not a bad guess because sometimes the celestial court meets in Jerusalem when there's a prophet in Jerusalem like Isaiah 6. But since they're not there and Darius is, uh, sorry, Daniel is in Babylon, where are they? Good. Very good. There, yes, this is a dream, but uh, the, the, the dream is the link to the heavenly realm, much like Joseph. That's another link between Daniel and Joseph. As, as uh, I forget who said it last week, uh, Joseph is the only other person other than Daniel, the only two people who have dreams and interpret dreams. You'll find that Joseph, husband of Mary and father of Jesus, has dreams as well, but they're, they're interpreted for him. Hey, get up and take the child and flee to Egypt. Okay, you can come back from Egypt now. Uh, you know, So it's not the same thing, even if it's the same form of communication. So a dream turns into a celestial courtroom. Did you, did you notice that it's not just the Ancient of Days sitting on a throne? Thrones is plural in your uh, translation, right? You ever thought about the fact that God gives thrones to his celestial family? Some are standing there. Some are seated on, on thrones. He gives authority and power away. This is what the God of the Bible does. He didn't just do it for humanity. And he's not just working in and through humanity. Again, with heaven and earth overlapping, earth in, in Genesis 1 and 2 is modeled after what's already been going on in heaven. So we shouldn't be surprised that his celestial image bearers, his celestial sons, actually hold the same authority and power uh, that we do here on earth, and much more of it because they're higher beings than we are. So God sets up his entire court, and his entire court comes, and then the Son of Man character comes. But if he's coming into heaven, where is he coming from? Because it doesn't get said, but it is implied. Coming with the clouds of heaven, where is he coming from? Could be. That is entirely possible. I would say probably highly likely. Where would you go to die? I was just going to say that's what I envisioned too because that, that like, I felt like that was like the other side of after he'd been back on earth for 40 days and then he ascended. Like it talked about the clouds then too. Right. 
So, so then quite literally, where is he coming from to get into heaven? You just, you just said it. Earth. 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 Okay. And, I didn't feel like that was the right answer. No, but, no, no. But this looks it, to me like the other side you, of here, he, his attention. Yes. So here's the thing. Um, it's so easy to overlook that the Son of Man is actually coming, even in this scene, from the lower stations of earth into the heavenly realm. Because we're used to reading Jesus talking about coming on the clouds, not understanding what that means, and then reading it as if it's talking about his second coming. But when even when Jesus is talking about coming on the clouds and telling Caiaphas, at his, you will see the Son of Man's coming on the clouds of heaven. He is not talking about the second coming. He is talking about ascending in status to this, the position of authority in the universe that only he is going to hold. The position of the Son of Man here, where all authority and power in heaven and earth are given to him. Where he rules all kingdoms forever. Everlasting dominion. Okay? That is Jesus' point. And, and if you have to read Daniel 7 correctly, the order of the Son of Man ascending into the heavenly realm and the heavenly uh, courtroom to gain that power, to be given that power from the earth, riding on the clouds is not really a second coming. It can be used of a second coming because it's really about his power and authority. Because it doesn't come from Jewish text. It comes from the Jewish neighbors the Ugaric people just north of Israel that uh, worshipped Baal. I have here with me, to prove this to you, the Baal cycle. My copy of it, if you read, these are very short stories. Uh, Victorious Baal is the first story. There's two stories, Victorious Baal and Baal defeats Mot. Mot is the god of death. And the first story, he defeats Yom. Yom is the, the chaos sea dragon. Sound familiar? Because it's exactly Genesis 1. It's, it's Psalm 72, where Yahweh defeats a chaos sea dragon. It's, it's Leviathan. Again, think mythologically here. Sounds like an <laughs> Where do you think uh, animes are getting it from, right? The, the, all ancient Near Eastern Semitic people, Babylon, Persia, Ugarit, and the Hebrews all think in similar terms. The Hebrews steal... The, the language of their neighbors surrounding them, and they apply the ideas of their gods to Yahweh. You will find in the Old Testament, in places like, let me look it up here on my notes because I didn't, uh, Yahweh rides on the clouds in Psalm 68, 104, Isaiah 19, Nahum in 1, uh, I mean, in, in several places, Yahweh is the cloud rider, but here it's the Son of Man who's the cloud rider. But in the Baal cycle, which came before all of these Old Testament texts, it's Baal who's the cloud rider. Baal goes to war against Yom. He defeats Yom, and he is victorious, becomes king of the gods. He is the second in command, the vice regent to El, the high god, who's too transcendent to interact with the, the physical universe. So Baal is the, the physical vice regent for, for El on earth. And he gets the title Cloud Rider. Uh, Kothar Vaskasis answered, Certainly I am telling you, Prince Baal, and let me repeat to you, Cloud Rider. Of, I'm just going to read this out. Baal dragged out and dismembered Yom. And he judged Nahar, another name for Yom. Asher, uh, Ashira rebuked him and said, Shame, Victorious Baal, shame, Rider on the Clouds, as Prince Yom is our captive. So he was already captive before uh, Baal killed him. Uh, but because he's a god, Yom... Uh, He's not quite dead. He'll get to talk a little bit more here. Uh, so B Baal's ashamed. She answered, Yom is certainly dead. Baal reigns as king. Yom said, I'm certainly dying. Certainly Baal will now reign as king. Warmth is indeed assured uh, for the roots because some of this is, is cut off. We've lost uh, the stuff. Then Baal indeed reigns as king. And Yom answered, I'm dying. Certainly Baal now is king. And if you just read the story, it, it keeps going. Uh, which enemy has arisen against Baal? Which enemy of the cloud rider? What enemy against the cloud rider? Which enemy rises against Baal? The servants answered, no enemy rises against Baal. No adversary against the cloud rider. So it's, it's and then Baal goes on and, he, and the gods talk to El, the high god, and he says, there's a problem with Baal becoming our king. He doesn't have a temple. So he spends seven days building a temple, uh, just like God spends seven days creating, and earth is designed as a temple in Genesis 1. Mighty, the mighty Baal replied, the cloud rider responded, 
Those arose and they began to insult me. One spat on me among the assembly of the sons of God, like there's an assembly going on here in among the gods, plural, any celestial being uh, can, can be called a god in Hebrew or Aramaic. Uh, abomination of my table, the filth of my cup, I drank from. The, there are two feasts that Baal abhors. There are three feasts that the cloud rider finds shameful. The Old Testament does that too. There are two, there are three, whatever, you know. And it just keeps going on. Baal can be called Cloud Rider once he's, you know, victorious over the forces of chaos. That is Yom, the chaos sea dragon. So my point is this. The Old Testament Hebrews didn't come up with their language for Yahweh or Messianic language in a vacuum. They take it from what they know, and what they know is the religious language or the mythological stories of their neighbors, and then they apply it to God. And when God declares he's going to bring about a son of man who's going to turn over all authority in heaven and earth, make him second in the whole creation, he uses the language that his people would understand, the language of their northern neighbors, Ugarit. God is cloud rider, and he's making this son of man cloud rider who will come from earth into heaven. If we understand that, it should seem pretty obvious that Jesus' status as the one who comes on the clouds is him saying, I am the one who will gain all authority in heaven and earth. He's going to do it, not by a killing or slaying a chaos dragon. <laughs> He's going to do it by killing and slaying a chaos dragon that unleashes all of its chaos onto him. That's the crucifixion. All of the injustice of the illegal trial at night, the, the fact that, that they claim he's breaking all these laws that God never instituted, like Daniel, the Son of Man is going to go into the grave, a sealed grave, for three days, just like Daniel went into the lion's den. And just like Daniel was resurrected from the lion's den, the Son of Man is quite literally going to be resurrected and become cloud rider. Gain the authority in heaven and earth to rule and redeem the heavens and the earth. This is the New Testament gospel's point, but we don't read Jesus' story as if he's ascended to this place in, of, of authority in heaven and earth. We like to, to skip around, and to, to an extent, we all do this and we all have to do this. You can't pay attention to everything the Bible has to say uh, all at one time. So, for instance, if you went down the road to Midwestern Seminary and you were walking out of the main student building, on the wall it would say, go therefore into all nations and make disciples, right? In big lettering so that you can't miss it. And that's what Baptists do. We focus on the go part, but we divorce it. That's verse 20. We divorce it from verse 19. The gospel summarized by Matthew one last time in one sentence. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. Turn these people to my reign. Go pre preach and proclaim that I have come on the clouds. Right now, I'm going to literally take some clouds up there and go ascend beyond all these celestial powers and heavenly thrones here. And I'm going to sit down on my father's throne the way he talks about in Revelation. And then he turns around in Revelation and he talks about sharing the power. He says, you can sit down with me on my throne the way I sit down on my father's throne. Because he goes on reading Daniel 7. Verse 15, I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the vision that passed through my mind disturbed me. And I approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of this. And so he told me, and he gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kings, or some of your translations may say kingdoms, either way it's right that will rise on the earth, but the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. And then he goes on, and, and, he, and he, if you just skip down to o, verse 24, as he specifies things we're not going to go into. Uh, tell you what, verse 21, As I watched this horn waging war against the holy people and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and announced, pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is the fourth kingdom. It will be different from the other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth. The, skip down to verse 25. He will speak against the Most High and will oppress the holy people. He will try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be devoured and delivered into his hands for the times, times, and half a time. But the court will sit, and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. 
Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under the heavens will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. And the Most High, His kingdom, will be an everlasting kingdom. All the rulers will worship and obey Him. This is the end of the matter. And so, what is specifically given to the Son of Man in 13 and 14 is communalized, given to all the people of God in the latter half of the chapter. So is it the Son of Man individually, or is it the people communally? The answer is yes, because the people who come through the Son of Man to enter into God's kingdom will possess the kingdom forever and ever. They will rule with authority and power in resurrected life alongside the resurrected king himself. These are all ideas that the New Testament authors are holding in the back of their mind because they don't skip these stories. They're reading Daniel as if to saying, wait a second, we've already heard this story before. Thrown into a pit, resurrected out, a dreamer uh, who interpreted this and became second in command. That's Joseph's story. He's thrown into the pit of prison. He's kept there for years, and yet he's resurrected in the sense that he comes out and becomes the second most powerful person on the planet. It's the same story, the same pattern repeating itself. In history, in real time, and so the Jews are picking up on this throughout the Second Temple 500-year period, so that by the time you get to Christ, Christ is using the same language to talk to himself and in a way that some people have described, and I don't know if this is C.S. Lewis or uh, he merely borrowed the phrase from somebody else, that Christianity is the myth that came true. Because what we argue for is that in a moment in history, God literally took a dead man and gave him life again, never to die again. And more than just that, he gave that man authority over all of heaven and earth. And the last thing that I want to read to you, the way that we should be reading and parsing out our New Testaments, if you turn to 1 Corinthians 15, very famous passage throughout here, and yet the only place where Paul ever actually spells out the details of the gospel, everywhere else he assumes it, in, uh, let's see, verse starting uh, verse 23, 23 through 28, says, Talking about the resurrection, but also assuming the authority that comes with the resurrection. Each in his turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come, and he will hand over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. That's terms used for evil celestial beings, evil gods. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Then the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when he says everything uh, he has put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. For when he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him, who has put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. It's like the, the, the Son of Man, I mean, Jesus says this over and over again, that the Father is greater than him, that, that he only rules with the authority of God the Father, the Ancient of Days, in, in this language the one who created all other celestial powers uh, and, and human powers, appointed to rule, and yet he put his own son beyond any of them. Do you read Christ's story in such a way that it actually climaxes with that authority and power being given to him? Or do you get stuck at the cross and just deal with your own sins and not realize that God is actually up to something much, much bigger? Joseph, there's more going on in Joseph's story than we think and realize. The, the Hebrews pick up on that throughout time. Daniel's life mimics it. And yet more than, than just Joseph or more than just Daniel, these messianic figures throughout history, the story plays out again and again and again, but it ultimately played out with Jesus becoming the enthroned king of heaven and earth. If we can actually parse out and read the text in such a way that we come to that conclusion, we're meant to. You should read other texts other than just the Bible to actually understand where these ideas come from. Okay, any questions? Not that you answer anything. Fair. <laughs> so, but yes, I do. Well, you can shoot them to me. I will, and I we can talk about them later. Whole file, file thing. I don't know anything about it. it so it's curious. so you you re remember this is what ah Ahab, the northern Sumerian king, terrible king, married. Jezebel and brought this down into the king, northern kingdom of Israel. They understood Baal worship. They knew Baal's story. 
There's a reason why they take elements of his story and apply it to their God, because it's just familiar to people by the time they're writing, by the time Elijah is preaching this stuff. That the people that worship Baal apply Christianity, the story of, of our God to theirs, or that we apply theirs to ours? I, probably both. Okay. Uh, That's where it gets but but, but it's like... his, historically, it's working where they're taking Baal's story and, and applying it to Yahweh because... That's what they know. Yeah. And, and they want... They, it's called polemic. They want to make the argument that Yahweh's really <laughs> the God and King uh, uh, of heaven and earth uh, that they claimed Baal was. So they take the elements of, of what made Baal victorious and they apply it to Yahweh to make the point that Yahweh is the real high God. So, I mean, it's basically saying that yeah, the God you've been worshiping is our God. We're both we were both worshiping the same God. No, because no. if they did that, the the Elijah versus the the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel would have made no sense. Oh, okay. yeah, right. But but they they want them to understand who the real God is. They understand that the real God can be called Cloud Rider. So they just applied that language to Yahweh to say it's not Baal, it is Yahweh. It's not the Pharisees. It's not Rome. It's Christ. Right. It's it's this. Backwood carpenter, nobody from Galilee, uh, and and he's giving all that power to his church, you know. Uh, so get up and do your job. You know, you have the power to do it. What's the excuse? 